Good morning, everyone, and welcome from Notre Dame, Indiana. This is 10 Years Hence. I'm James O'Rourke, a professor of management in the Mendoza College of Business at Notre Dame, and I'll be your host for this series. This is a third of our series on news, fake news, and deep fakes. How do we know what's true? Our speaker today is Suzanne Spaulding, Senior Advisor for Homeland Security and Director of Defending Democratic Institutions Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC. She also serves as a member of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Prior to joining CSIS, Ms. Spaulding was Undersecretary at the Department of Homeland Security, leading the National Protection and Programs Directorate, which has since been renamed as the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Ms. Spaulding has served in both Republican and Democratic administrations, including as Assistant General Counsel at the Central Intelligence Agency and on both sides of the aisle in Congress. She was general counsel for the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and minority staff director for the U.S. House of Representatives Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Additionally, Ms. Spaulding is the former chair of the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Law and National Security and co-founder of the ABA's Cybersecurity Legal Force. Ms. Spaulding serves on numerous boards and is a member of the Homeland Security Experts Group. Suzanne, welcome. Nice to have you here. Thank you so much uh, for that lovely introduction and for the invitation to be part of this uh, really prestigious lecture series, 10, year, 10 Years Hence. Well, a year ago when we thought about subjects for this year, this was in the mix, but it was pretty far down the list. And the longer I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, this is actually going to be something. We need to investigate this. And um, among the very best of names offered to me, uh, yours came up very early. So thank you so much for the generosity of your time and your expertise. So a couple of procedural issues. Before I turn uh, the floor over to you, I would tell our guests who are logged on in the US and around the world, that if you go to the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, you'll be able to type in a question. Just type it directly and we'll have a look at that. Um, at about, um, well, let's see, right now it's a quarter to 11 here in the Eastern time zone. Uh, at about 11.30 or 11.35 perhaps, um, we'll go to questions. We'll take audience questions and I'll pass those along to Suzanne and we'll sign off uh, promptly at 12 noon, keeping the brand promise here. So Suzanne, uh, let me turn this over to you and uh, we'll be back with questions when it seems appropriate. Terrific, thanks so much. And again, thanks for, for this opportunity to talk with uh, your audience about a really important subject, um, disinformation and democracy. Uh, I'm going to share some slides here. Here we go. Uh, so Beyond the Ballot is also the name of a report that we put out in uh, May of 2019 that you can find at CSIS.org. Uh, talking about the work that we've been doing at the Center for Strategic and International Studies for the last uh, three plus years, looking at how information operations are undermining public confidence in our justice system. Uh, and that will be the uh, bulk of my conversation with you today. I'm gonna talk to you about the nature of the threat uh, from disinformation and to do so in the context of a particular aspect of this that we have been looking at that we think has not gotten much public attention. And then I want to talk about what we think is the most sustainable long term way of countering disinformation, and that is through civic education. So when I start, I always like to uh, begin with some overarching points. My uh, work at CSIS and my briefing to you today 
really focuses in on one adversary uh, who is engaged in information operations targeting democracy, and that is Russia. And the reason that we focus on Russia is because they are the uh, country that is most uh, rigorous, vigorous in its uh, efforts to use information operations to weaken democracy, to undermine public trust in our democracy and in our democratic institutions. <clears throat> but we are mindful, <clears throat> excuse me, that other countries uh, also engage in information operations targeting the United States and that increasingly, and particularly uh, with respect to China over the last several months, we see them taking a page from what my colleague Heather Conley uh, calls the Kremlin playbook. Uh, so we'll focus on Russia, but, but understand, of course, that, that the points we're making can apply more broadly and also to domestic disinformation, which increasingly is what our adversaries amplify uh, and presents very similar threats. The other point to keep in mind as I walk through this is that these information operations exploit weaknesses and vulnerabilities of our own making. So I will talk with you about the narratives that we see in these information operations from Russia. And you will see that Russia is not inventing these narratives. They are taking existing division, uh, lines of division in our country, existing skepticism uh, about the justice system and amplifying, exploiting it and uh, making it appear to be uh, a system that is irrevocably broken. And that's an important distinction. That's my last point is that uh, what we're trying to raise awareness about here is not the danger of criticism of our institutions, of our justice system. Uh, our justice system is flawed. And my friends who are judicial reform advocates and those who march peacefully in our streets, they are patriots who are trying to bring about change to make our institutions stronger, to make our country better and stronger. But that is not Putin's goal. So I came to this issue from my time as the undersecretary at the Department of Homeland Security, responsible for uh, the security and resilience of our nation's critical infrastructure. And in 2016, that meant we spent a lot of time focused on election infrastructure. And as I thought about what we saw in 2016, um, uh, uh, we, we realized that what we were really seeing were three different aspects of information operations. Uh, there was the straight up propaganda, uh, which we learned so much more about in 2017 as the social media platforms went back and looked through all of its data and started releasing Russian associated uh, uh, content. Um, but there was the straight up online propaganda. <clears throat> there was the hack and leak of emails from the DNC and others, right? Uh, which was clearly part of an information operation. So blending traditional cyber activity and then uh, putting it out online. And then there was what initially looked like just traditional cyber activity, right? Uh, malicious cyber activity targeting voter registration databases. But it did not take us long to realize that this was uh, very likely in furtherance of the information operation. That if you could, if an adversary could get in to a voter registration database and alter or corrupt that data, causing uh, chaos on election day, that that could undermine the public's faith and confidence in the legitimacy of that process and therefore in the legitimacy of the outcome of the election. So all of those were in furtherance of information operations. <clears throat> when I got out of DHS at noon on January 20th of 2017 uh, and had an opportunity to kind of step back and look at the bigger picture, mindful that our intelligence community had made it clear in their assessment in January of 2017 that what we saw from Russia in 2016 was just one part of a longer term broad based campaign to undermine our democracy and our institutions. I thought I have a background in national security and, and intelligence. Uh, and so I, I did what we call red teaming. I, I try to put myself in Putin's mind and say, if that, if that was my goal, if I were Putin and I wanted to undermine democracy through undermining its institutions, where would I go next? What other institution like elections is so dependent upon the public's faith and confidence in the legitimacy of the process 
to respect the legitimacy of the outcome. And I'm trained as a lawyer, I immediately thought about our justice system and our courts. Right? They, they don't have any real way of enforcing across society uh, their decisions. But we have a social contract in which we have agreed to view their decisions as binding. Uh, and that's an important pillar of our democracy. It's an important part of the peaceful transition of power. It is how our economy functions. It's so fundamental that we sometimes take it for granted. But as I thought about the ways in which the techniques that we saw in 2016 could be used against the courts, I, I, I quickly realized how fragile in many ways uh, that is that, and, and how it could be used to undermine public trust and confidence. And here you see you know, the hack and leak of sensitive court documents, right? Uh, altering data in court uh, uh, databases, altering decisions, uh, altering court orders about who gets released and who doesn't, who, who owes what, you know, pays what amount of fine, et cetera. Preventing access to information, which we have seen, right? These ransomware attacks that shut down cities also impact the municipal courts and, and individuals' ability to access justice. So all of these things can undermine trust. We've seen most recently in the solar winds hack, um, the uh, news that it appears to have impacted the federal judiciary's case management database all across the country, the PACER system, which contains uh, sensitive data for thousands of courts uh, of cases. And, and again, uh, threatens to undermine the public's trust in the courts and faith in the courts. So as we started looking at this, having heard nothing about it really in the press or anywhere else, we thought, well, maybe we're getting ahead of something. Maybe for once we can, we can get out in front of this be before it starts to happen. But very quickly we realized that no, this, this has been going on. And one of the first things we came across was this uh, interesting case in Twin Falls, Idaho. This was in the summer of 2016, in June of 2016 in this small town of Twin Falls, Idaho, uh, social media was running rampant with emotionally charged allegations that two young Syrian refugees had raped a five-year-old girl in the basement of an apartment building at knife point and were later seen high-fiving their dads. The authorities eventually were able to come out and, and tell the public that none of those facts were true that in fact, there were three young people, two young boys and a young girl uh, in the basement of a building and something untoward uh, apparently happened, but there were no Syrian refugees involved. There was no knife point. There did not appear to be any rape and there was no high-fiving of the dads. These uh, allegations that are so emotionally charged were all embellishments and lies. Uh, but the authorities were slow to get that out because the case involved juveniles and, and there were privacy restrictions. And so this was allowed to take hold uh, on the internet and, and tremendous criticism of the prosecutor, of the judge, of the local officials for covering up this horrible crime by refugees against an American. So here is some of what was found uh, online, what was, what was taking place. And here you see the reference to three Syrian refugees raping, raping a girl at knife point um, and liberals wanting to accept refugees going after the politicians in Twin Falls for what they claimed was a loose policy on accepting Syrian refugees. Um, and uh, and that the and the implication that the prosecutor and the judge were tools of those politicians and and trying to cover up for the politicians. And here another one where the federal prosecutor Wendy Olson was trying to tell people to stop spreading the false information, and so they went after her. Um, these two accounts, Red LA News and Patriot Raphael, are not concerned Americans. These are fake accounts set up by the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, Russia. They had uh, decided to jump in here and exacerbate uh, uh, and amplify these, this false narrative 
um, about what was happening in Twin Falls, Idaho. And these are just two examples of many. Here's a Facebook post uh, calling on people to turn out into the streets to protest this horrible crime and the failure of officials to prosecute the Syrian refugees who had gone after an American, um, secured borders, posted this on Facebook, trying to again stir up this rally on August 27th. In 2018, in the Department of Justice's indictment against the Internet Research Agency, we learned that Secure Borders is not a group of concerned Twin Falls, Idaho citizens or Americans. It again is a made up affinity group invented in the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, the group that was responsible for so much of the disinformation at that time and continuing to this day. Uh, so as we be continued to look into this, we, we, we found that the Russian disinformation information operations really uh, take, take advantage of three channels. The one we have focused on so far is the uh, online propaganda, and here's an example, American injustice system, but also their state-sponsored propaganda outlets like RT, which stands for Russia Today, and is funded by the Russian government, and Sputnik, another Russian propaganda outlet funded by the government, but also official statements by, this is Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister of Russia, who often amplifies uh, these narratives that are being pushed through Russian propaganda and information operations. So as we poured over in 2017, the uh, over 11 million tweets uh, that had been attributed to Russia uh, and using fake accounts pretending to be Americans and, um, and, and many uh, Facebook posts that had all been released by the platforms. We, we went through it looking at this lens <clears throat> of where were they targeting the justice system and where did their efforts to uh, exacerbate pre-existing divisions and skepticism in this country have implications for the justice system. And these were the four frames, narrative frames that we saw coming up again and again. The bottom line of which is all to challenge the notion that our justice system is independent and impartial. So it, <clears throat> we've talked already about the narrative that the justice system tolerates, protects and covers up crimes committed against immigrants. That the justice system operationalizes the institutionally racist and corrupt police state, again, uh, picking up on uh, pre-existing narratives and weaknesses that are of our own making, right? The injustices within our justice system, uh, but amplifying those as, as an irrevocable attribute uh, of our justice system. <clears throat> that the justice system directly supports and enables corrupt corporations, and that the justice system is a tool of the political elite. So here we see again, uh, on, when we, as we looked over the online activity, here are some uh, attacks against a Ninth Circuit, Ninth Circuit just district judge, Judge Robart, who was the first judge to uh, issue a restraining or a temporary restraining order against what was then known as the Muslim ban, uh, the, the order restricting um, uh, closing our borders. To, and, uh, and here you see uh, again, tweets going after Judge Robart. He received uh, thousands, tens of thousands. Some, one estimate from Judge Fogel, a colleague of his, was that he received a million uh, tweets, uh, phone calls, emails, threatening uh, uh, letters uh, uh, against threatening him. And in fact, at least two dozen of those were serious enough that the US Marshal Service provided him with uh, some 24-hour protection for some period of time. But again, <clears throat> these, this Tennessee GOP and Texas Lone Star, very active accounts made up by the Internet Research Agency in Russia, fake accounts pretending to be Americans and going after um, our justice system and public faith in the justice system. Recently, there was a 60 Minutes <clears throat> uh, segment that talked about these threats to Judge Robart and 
made the point that these online threats can become real world uh, threats. And, and this is uh, Judge Salas was in that segment um, talking about the horrific attack uh, that killed her son and shot her husband, uh, an attack uh, aimed at her um, that was in part incited uh, by online activity. So we know that <clears throat> these can have very real impact in the real world. One of the things we've also seen with Russian disinformation is that uh, they will play on both sides. Uh, they don't actually have an ideological dog in this fight. They just want to exacerbate the fight. So while the narrative that America is a racist country has been is one they have pushed for many decades uh, and where they have fertile ground, um, they will also come in on the other side where it uh, where they see an opportunity to exacerbate divisions and particularly to turn people out into the streets. Putin talks about and his and his military general uh, Jeremasov talks about um, exploiting the protest potential of the population. So they do this, you know, very intentionally to try to turn people out into the streets. Um, and here we see. Uh, again, this is a fake affinity group created by the Russians, blackmattersus.com. Uh, and they are, you know, uh, again, uh, amplifying uh, and, and trying to stir up further emotions around the fatal shooting of a young black man, Alton Sterling. But a few days later, when a black man, Mika Johnson, shot and killed five police officers in a horrible shooting in Dallas, Texas. Um, Heart of Texas weighs in to, to get people out into the streets under the banner of Blue Lives Matter. Heart of Texas, yes, is a, uh, an account created by the Internet Research Agency in Russia. So that's just a sense of some of the online propaganda. But as I said, they also use their state sponsored propaganda outlets like RT. And one of my favorites is, and I say that uh, cynical, sarcastically, um, is America's Lawyer, which is a weekly program on RT. It's hosted by a Pensacola trial attorney named Mike Papantonio. And, and every week he tells the stories about how incredibly broken and corrupt our justice system is. And this is uh, you know, just a, an opening of one of his episodes that I think captures well the, the narrative that he is pushing there. To say that the justice system in the United States is broken would be a gross understatement. Corporations and corrupt politicians have taken control, turning the once impartial judiciary into a tool for the elite to use for their own gain. And again, I want to point out that uh, you know this is taking a completely one-sided view, um, not suggesting that there are some problems with the justice system, in fact, some serious problems that need to be reformed and talking about how to bring about change, but really driving a message that it is an irrevocable attribute of the system. So uh, I started talking about this uh, program and, and RT's role generally in pushing these narratives a, couple, you know, a few years ago. And in December of 2018, I guess I got their attention and they decided to go after me. Uh, and so they, they on several of their programs, uh, did profiles in which they called me a war pimp, uh, said that I was a war hawk pushing for a cold war with Russia. And this is when I realized how fast and loose they really are with the facts. Um, this is uh, the host of, of America's Lawyer talking with his employee, Farrah Cousins, and, and describing me uh, saying that I am paid millions of dollars by defense contractors, uh, which was a surprise to my husband who worried that I was holding out on him. Uh, but of course, the reality is that we are paid uh, a, a, a modest sum uh, by a found bipartisan, uh, nonpartisan foundation called the Democracy Fund uh, that supports our ongoing research, uh, not defense contractors. Um, 
I talked about the propaganda outlets and the online outlets. This is the uh, an example of official statements, and this is from Putin himself uh, about uh, the American justice system. This was in the fall of 2017 when we had seized some additional diplomatic facilities of Russia's uh, as a sanction, and and he gave a press conference in China in which he you know, complained that this was a violation of their property rights and that he was going to ask his foreign ministry to file a lawsuit in US courts. And he said, sarcastically, we will see how effectively the much lauded American judicial system works. I think Putin has three audiences for his uh, ongoing information operations. The first and most important to him, I believe, is his own population. He does not want them to long for Western style democracy, right? So he wants to say, uh, look, it's just as corrupt and broken as our system. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, it's nothing that you should long for, right? He also is appealing to and reaching out to audiences all around the world. And RT and Sputnik and other Russian news outlets are broadcast in multiple languages all around the world. And his message is very similar to these countries where we compete for influence, which is uh, you know, that America is, is, again, just corrupt and hypocritical and broken. So China's information operations are different. They are traditionally pushing their model as something that is a better model where their governance structure that allows them to control their population and grow their economy is something that others should emulate. That's a model that we have to compete against. Putin knows he has no model to hold up to the world. Their economy is a shambles. Uh, you know, they, they, they're a mess. Uh, they are a declining power. And so his objective is simply to pull us down, to make it appears that we are no better than, than Russia is. Um, and that is the message that he is sending to his third audience, which of course is our population. That the American system, that American democracy and its institutions are irrevocably broken, corrupt, hypocritical, chaotic. That's the narrative uh, that they are pushing in the hopes of weakening our ability to mobilize to meet the, the challenges that we face. So we saw them back. Of course, they, they never left. When, uh, when people would say in 2017, you know, that we think Russia will be back, uh, I used to, you know, throw my shoes at the, at the TV screen because uh, I knew they had never left. Um, and, and indeed, our national security officials, you know, have consistently reinforced that message. This was uh, there was a statement that was put out uh, in the run up to our elections this past November by all four of our national security entities, the FBI, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency at DHS, which is the organization I used to lead, uh, was my successor was Chris Krebs, uh, the National uh, uh, Counterintelligence and Security Center in the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and the National Security Agency, all of whom uh, we're sounding the alarm about continued foreign influence and, and attempts to interfere in our elections. And this was a statement by the head of our counterintelligence um, that democracies are attempting to undermine our democracy and our democratic values. Uh, FBI Director Christopher Wray, who as a side note, I will simply uh, you know, encourage those of you who don't mind sitting in front of your computers all day today this afternoon uh, at two o'clock, I believe at CSIS.org, I will be uh, having a, a fireside chat with FBI Director Christopher Ray about the importance of civics education in addressing this threat uh, and other national security threats. So um, encourage you to tune in or it, the video will be posted subsequently and you can watch it um, on, on another day. Uh, but he has been quite uh, uh, open about the fact that this is a 365 day a year threat. This is not just about elections. Uh, and this goes directly to the theme of this year's this 10 years hence conference, of course, um, it, uh, you know, that, that, it, that, that our adversaries efforts to use social media, fake news, propaganda, false personas to spin us up, pit us against each other, uh, to, to exacerbate 
uh, divisiveness and discord and to undermine America's faith in democracy. It's not just an election cycle threat. It's a 365 day a year threat. And in fact, you may have seen uh, this week, the FBI put out a notice that was coordinated with the Department of Homeland Security, a warning about the increased use of synthetic content. That's uh, another way of talking about these deep fakes, uh, all of this fake content that can be created in very convincing ways, uh, sounding a warning uh, that we need to be on uh, alert for, for uh, the use of that synthetic content. And, and my greatest concern about that is less that Americans will be convinced by fake content than that they will uh, decide that they don't know what to believe, right? And I, and I think that's a big part of certainly Putin's objective is to drive us into a post-truth world in which we have given up. We've been so inundated with false information, um, with things we can't trust, that we no longer believe in the concept of truth, that we no longer at least believe in our ability to discern what's true. And between uh, convincing us that our system is irrevocably broken and cannot be changed, and that we can never be informed, Putin will rob us of the informed and engaged citizenry upon which democracy so desperately depends. That is the risk, I think, ultimately, of disinformation to our democracy. So we've seen them continue this. We saw this in the 2020 election uh, and in the run up to it and in post election, where these are all headlines from uh, RT and Sputnik from those Russian propaganda outlets pushing this narrative about a rigged election, again, amplifying domestic voices, picking up on domestic narratives uh, that further Putin's objective and pushing those narratives. This is Sergei Narishkin, who is the uh, head of the Russian uh, SVR, which is their external intelligence service, um, you know, talking about uh, openly about, again, riots in the streets, a social cri crisis that will deepen uh, in the United States, really uh, hopeful thinking, uh, again, on the part of uh, the Russian national security infrastructure, which uh, repeatedly tries to tap into, as I say, the protest potential uh, of the population. Um, again, not to bring about change, but to, but to provoke people to take to the streets um, in despair, having given up hope which is when things turn violent. And indeed, that's what we saw, uh, I believe on January 6th, uh, was uh, in you know, the, 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 these narratives that push the idea, again, the, that the election was mass, that there was massive rigging of the election and the attack on the courts, because I believe that the people who uh, felt that it was appropriate to violently attack the Capitol and the constitutional process that was underway there that day, did so in the face of 60, over 60 court cases that had rejected challenges to the legitimacy of the election. And that is exactly what has been my concern uh, with disinformation that undermines the legitimacy of our justice system is that it gives people permission to ignore court decisions, to view them as illegitimate. Uh, and, and I think that's what we saw on January 6th. And here is a post, just one of many, many from Parler, which is one of the um, uh, online uh, platforms that is uh, favored by certainly many of the people uh, who, who were at the Capitol that day. And this was in the run up again to that day, um, talking about no legal remedies are available, right? Um, that, and calling for violence. So this is, this is the real danger to our democracy ultimately, uh, and, and why I think it's so important that we come together to counter disinformation. 
So these are the reports, the major reports that we've done at CSIS. This first one was, was actually published in February of 2018, uh, the result of uh, several workshops and, and research through, throughout 2017, countering adversary threats to democratic institutions, where we made our first recommendation for a, a reinvigorated civics education uh, as a way of uh, reminding Americans of our shared values, right, of, the, uh, of our fundamental uh, values that we have in common, uh, that democracy must be fought for because it is under attack, that it is worth fighting for, not because it's perfect, but because it can be changed. That is the beauty of democracy over authoritarian and totalitarian regimes, <clears throat> but it can only be changed if we are educated, informed, uh, and empowered to hold our institutions accountable for living up to our expectations and empowered to be more effective agents of change to move our democracy towards that more perfect union. Beyond the Ballot was published in May of 2019 and reflects the research and the findings of how the Kremlin was working to undermine our justice system. Uh, many more details uh, in this report than I was able to share with you today. But reinforcing and reiterating our uh, recommendation for um, uh, reinvigorated civics education on top of the, the kinds of things that we're doing now about um, using technology to better identify uh, inauthentic activity online, to take down that inauthentic activity where Russians are posing as Americans, um, to, to tag uh, disinformation online, all of the technical things that can be done and the, and the things that the platforms can do, teaching media literacy and critical in, uh, thinking skills, but also, again, reinforcing fundamental civics education. These are the lines of effort that we've been pursuing. We continue to update our research. We've been providing training for judges and courts on how they can uh, prepared for uh, detect and counter disinformation, false information that undermines public trust in judges and in the courts. Um, we are working with them to develop uh, effective rapid response capabilities uh, to respond to disinformation. And then again, uh, our effort uh, to promote civics as a national security imperative. Um, for the last year, we have been engaged in a strategic dialogue on civics as a national security imperative, uh, graciously funded by Craig Newmark Philanthropies. And what we have learned as we've delved into this civics work with those who have been in the civics trenches for many, many years, iCivics, the Civics Now Coalition, and many others, the civic mission in schools, um, are some pretty shocking statistics. We're all familiar with the surveys, uh, you know, where people can't name the three branches of of government, but these trends of you know where where young Americans are losing faith in democracy are are particularly troubling. So a survey that showed thirty five percent of millennials reported losing faith in American democracy and only twenty five percent confident in the democratic system. A survey of Americans that found twenty four percent said that rule by a strong leader who doesn't have to bother with Congress and elections was a very good or fairly good way to run the country. And 18% said the same about army rule. 43% of voters nationwide somewhat agree, at least somewhat agree with the quote that the constitution made sense in the 18th century, but is irrelevant in the 21st century. The state of civic education in this country is really uh, one that requires urgent uh, addressing. The National Assessment of Educational Progress uh, most recent showed that only 24% of eighth graders that took the test demonstrated a proficiency in civics. What we have seen over the years is that uh, civics has gotten squeezed out. And in part, that's come as a result of the appropriate and important emphasis on STEM education. Uh, but we need to be able to do both. Uh, what has happened is that our emphasis on STEM has squeezed out civics. It's come at the expense of civics education often. Um, and, the, and you see that in just simply the amount of federal investment, uh, $54 per, uh, 
per enrolled school child spent of federal funds on STEM compared to five cents per child on civics. And that's at the federal level, not, not taking into account what's happening at the state levels uh, and, and, and non-governmental support for STEM funding. Again, not calling for, uh, for stopping that support of STEM functions, but we've got, to, we've got to be able to do both. Both are terribly important. I recently interviewed uh, Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, uh, and talked with him about how important it is that civics and technology go hand in hand. And, uh, and he agreed that, for example, he thought all Microsoft employees was important for them to have a good grounding in civics education. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Roberts, in his 2019 year-end report, um, after our Beyond the Ballot report came out about attacks on the justice system, focused his year-end report on disinformation and noted that we've come to take democracy for granted. We've gotten complacent. Civic education has fallen by the wayside. But in our age, when social media can instantly spread rumor and false information on a grand scale, the public's need to understand our government and the protections it provides is ever more vital. The judiciary has an important role to play in civic education. All of us have an important role to play in civic education. And the good news is there's a growing awareness of this. A commission on public service came out with a, a report uh, last year that talked about uh, the importance of public service, but the importance of civics education. That was not what they were originally thought they would focus on, but it played a key role in their report because they realized how fundamentally important it is to regaining a sense of civic identity and civic responsibility. I serve on an entity that Congress created called the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Our focus is on a, cyber, a strategy for strengthening the the United States position in cyberspace and, and strengthening our cybersecurity. Again, not thinking we would focus on civics, but we realized uh, and, and have recommendations in our report that civics uh, education is a critical part of teaching the kind of civic responsibility that goes to uh, our directly to our, our cybersecurity and again, to countering the threat of disinformation that is so often enabled by malicious cyber activity. Um, we, we have uh, bipartisan legislation that's just been introduced this week, reintroduced uh, in the House and the Senate by Republicans and Democrats. It's called Civics Secures Democracy, and it is a significant piece of legislation designed to support and reinvigorate civics education across our country. Uh, the civics organizations led by iCivics and Civics Now and a wide range of organizations uh, in the last couple of weeks put out an Educating for Democracy roadmap with some tremendous resources uh, and, and, a, and a real path forward for how we move towards reinvigorating civics education on an urgent basis in the near term. And it is a bipartisan issue. This is a poll that was done by uh, Frank Luntz, who is a Republican pollster, uh, asked the, uh, you know, folks what would have the most positive and meaningful impact on strengthening the American identity. And you can see the choices that were offered to people to you know, which of these did they think would have the most impact on strengthening our sense of American identity. And civics education was the clear uh, choice uh, far and away. Surprisingly, perhaps, you know, rarely happens in polls, as you know, um, chosen by, by a majority of Democrats and Republicans. Uh, I should note the headline, a new Sputnik moment. Um, I talk about the investment in STEM. You know, of course, all, all, that was largely prompted by uh, the launch uh, uh, in the late 1950s of, uh, by Russia of the Sputnik satellite in a sense that we were falling behind. Um, and, and so this is often referred to today as uh, you know, what, that we need a new Sputnik moment to realize that we have become complacent about the state of civic literacy in this country and how dangerous it is. 
So I leave you with this uh, political cartoon from a local newspaper. Uh, local newspapers are, are increasingly where Americans turn to for uh, information that they think they can trust. Um, but I thought this was really quite telling. This is, of course, the fence with the barbed wire that now stands around the Capitol. Uh, and he's saying a better defense is teaching civics again. And I could not agree more. So with that, I wanna thank you for, for listening and I welcome your comments and your questions and look forward to the conversation. Well, Suzanne, thank you very much. This was really an interesting introduction for some of us to these issues. I think uh, for others, <clears throat> excuse me, this was uh, perhaps a review of things we've known to be true for some time. So there are a number of questions that have been uh, entered in the Q&A system, and uh, I've got a list of some of those. So let me categorize a few of them, if I may. And I'll begin with the larger global issues, talk about state actors, and then move to the social media platforms themselves, and then perhaps to our own communities. So <clears throat> first, I think, I should say in yesterday's New York Times, I saw the notion that um, <clears throat> Russia is now considering, which means they have a full plan for it, um, restricting Twitter in the, uh, in, in the Russian homeland. And the reason they gave is that uh, illegal and uh, unlawful, horrible, uh, immoral things are being advanced on Twitter. And so with that in mind, they want to choke the pipe. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so first, what's your thought about this? As I talked about it in class with my corporate communication students yesterday, I, um, I said this is an indication that nation states now realize that the borderless internet may have some technical choke points that they can take advantage of. Yeah, well, what's interesting uh, about what's happened, apparently, <clears throat> uh, is that as Russia, Russia apparently tried to throttle Twitter, they actually slowed down the internet across the country, the entire, uh, you know, internet, uh, more or less. And uh, so I think what one lesson they're learning is it's not as easy uh, as you think. Um, and so that might be a valuable lesson. But yes, it's, it should not be surprising at all. Uh, again, I think you know, Russia has not worked as hard and been as successful, certainly, as China has on restricting its population's access to information. Um, Putin instead has taken this path of uh, throwing lots of stuff up against the wall um, to confuse and and uh, people about what what they can believe and what you know what might be true and what's not true and and pushing a narrative that uh, that America always blames Russia it sees a Russia behind every bush et cetera et cetera to pre-existing narratives on which then they can hang as new things come in um, and control his population's response to the information in that way. Whereas China has, as, as we know, tried to put up this great wall and prevent its population from accessing information. So different approaches. But, I, but as I noted at the outset of my remarks, I do think that the two countries are watching each other and what they're doing and taking pages. So, uh, so I think Russia is thinking, you know, maybe uh, just trying to convince its public to not believe anything they see on the internet um, is not as successful. And I think we saw protests against corruption in the Russian government. That's something Putin worries about more than anything, I think. Uh, and so instead, they'll try to, to, to throttle it back, particularly for platforms that don't play by Russia's rules, right? Um, and, in, and, and similarly, I think we are increasingly seeing China um, putting out lots of false information. We see this in the COVID context, where they threw up you know, multiple theories about to try to counter the 
um, the narrative that this uh, COVID originated in China, they put out multiple theories about the, the US military, the US government, you know, all, all kinds of things, um, just to kind of confuse the narrative, to confuse the situation, very much taking a page from Putin's playbook. So I do think uh, they're, they're adopting um, some, they're looking at each other. Well, I think of Winston Churchill's famous quote in which he said, a lie will be out the door and halfway down the street before the truth has a chance to get its pants on. So um, it's difficult to counter something, which of course either doesn't exist or is patently untrue. It is very difficult to disprove those kinds of notions. Um, one of our guests coming along in a few weeks is a fellow called Jamie Fly. He is now back at Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty. And I'm old enough to remember when those were powerful influences in Eastern Europe. What's your view on the idea of operating um, a system to push um, the truth, at least the truth as we see it, or perhaps a more Western narrative on all of this? Is that likely to be productive? Well, I don't think there's any silver bullet. So there will be people who will always be skeptical uh, of information that's coming from a US uh, wow. sponsored, funded um, uh, media outlet. Uh, but we know that those broadcasts had an impact during the Cold War uh, on, on uh, shedding light on, on what democracy is all about, shedding light for people behind the Iron Curtain uh, about what alternatives, you know, an alternative way of governance in the life. Um, and so I think they're worth doing. I, uh, and, and I'm a big fan of Jamie. Jamie's work at the uh, uh, German Marshall Fund and the Alliance for Secure Democracy. Um, you know, he and I, uh, you know, talked about the, the disinformation threats that each of us were seeing and doing research on, and I'm pleased to see him moving over there. Good. Well, one more international question before we move to domestic issues. Um, I've heard you talk about Russia and about China. Um, China perhaps seems the more insidious because it's done in a smoother, less um, blunt way, perhaps. What about Iran? Do they, uh, are they a player in this space and uh, are there others? So Iran, I think, would like to be a player in this space. And we've certainly, <clears throat> the platforms have detected and, and, and released uh, uh, material that they have taken down that is a reflection of Iranian information operations targeting uh, the United States. So far, they're not terribly sophisticated uh, and it's on a relatively small scale. But this is you know, a point I made again at the beginning, which is that we should, in, we should assume that while Russia is the most aggressive player in the field today, that, uh, that, that other countries uh, will be coming on board. We've seen information operations from Saudi Arabia, from you know, any number of countries who will see this as an asymmetric uh, tool that they can use to achieve their objectives, whether it is influencing policy um, or influencing a public discourse. Good. Well, let's let's come back to our own country. Let's come back to the United States and to the way in which we communicate with one another. Uh, the Communications Act of 1935 set up some limits on ownership for radio and television stations. And then there were ownership categories for newspapers and all of that. The internet may have done away with the uh, legislative need for that sort of thing. But what we see now is that social media platforms themselves have become enormously powerful because that's where many people get their news. That's where people go first. You know, you may tune into CNN or to CBS, ABC, NBC, uh, Fox News to get more detail or video, but certainly the, the social media platforms have a function to alert people. Um, by way of background, the Communications Decency Act um, has, contains a section called 230 that 
says the owners and operators of the platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and others, are not really responsible, cannot be held legally liable for what um, posters would say on that platform. People have argued for the repeal of 230 and holding the operators of the system accountable. Is that going to help or is that going to make things worse? Yeah, it's a really important debate. Uh, and there are a number of aspects when we start to talk about the, the uh, power of these social media platforms and of, of these giant technology companies today. Um, certainly one aspect of this is, as you pointed out, is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And, you know, the history of that is really interesting. I, I'm old enough to remember I was there when those conversations were happening. Uh, and, uh, and initially, the argument was, look, we, we can't be held liable because we can't control. We're just, we're like the phone lines. Um, you know, the pho phone company's not held liable when, when criminals use the phone to conduct their criminal activity. Um, and we shouldn't be held liable when people use our platforms to do wrong things. Uh, we're just providing a mechanism for communication. And, uh, and that was, you know, sort of a compelling argument in the early days. Uh, but, but, but one of the things that happened was a growing push for dealing with um, uh, child pornography online, which is such a massive part of that online uh, discourse. And, uh, and the platforms, you know, conceded that they actually could do something to help that situation. And I think they felt a lot of public pressure and um, uh, to do so. And, but what they said was, look, we're, we, we are reluctant to do some content moderation because basically they've argued that they couldn't moderate, that they were simply the pipelines, that pipes that were used, uh, and that's yeah. why they couldn't be held liable. And they said, you know, if we're going to now try to find ways to go in and actually moderate content, um, we're worried that we'll begin to look more like publishers, like newspapers, which can be held liable for what happened, what, what appears on their pages. And, uh, and so we're not going to do that unless you give us, you know, liability protection, unless you say we won't be held liable, we still won't be held liable, even though we are in there trying to help, you know, reduce the amount of child pornography. Uh, later, it was, you know, reducing uh, terrorists. Um, uh, incitement and, and terrorist recruitment and, uh, and, and, and a number of areas where there was a strong public pressure and public policy. Uh, and then, of course, so that was the next evolution. And so they got this liability protection and they've been started doing some of that content moderation. <clears throat> then <clears throat> um, they started uh, getting larger and actually being content providers themselves, right? Not simply providing a, right. a place where, where others can content. come and do content, right? But producing their own content and, and becoming more. And, and, and I think today, you know, it's really hard to argue um, that they should have com complete blanket uh, immunity from liability for what goes on on their platforms. Um, well, here's, here's something really interesting that, you know, we talked about technology in my corporate communication class yesterday, and I went through the current figures, and I, I do a scope and scale of the internet. And the thing I really, I love about the lesson is that it's so current and exciting. The thing I hate about it is that the material is only good for about a week because it, it literally will change. If I go in next month, those figures will all have changed. So here's, here's a figure I think is truly mind boggling. YouTube says, and this is self-disclosure, YouTube is owned by Google. And YouTube says that on average, about 500 hours of video is uploaded every second. And so as you count 60 in a minute, I, I was, you know, 20 minutes into class when I pointed to that on the board. And so I turned to an accountant, and I said, will you please multiply 60 times the number of minutes and we now know how many hours of video have been uploaded on YouTube. And it was like 2000 hours since class began. And so I said, 
what does that tell you? And one of my students said, there are not enough human beings to look at that stuff and figure out whether it's offensive or illegal or a violation of the terms of service. And I said, exactly right. So what are they depending on? They thought about it a while. And one fellow said, well, um, an algorithm you know, could pick this up. They've admitted the algorithm is insufficient. The system is out of control. So either, you know, you turn the switch and say, well, this was fun, kids. Everybody go home, drive safely. Or you just say, do your best to figure out what's true or what's not. So in many ways, it's the scale of this operation that makes it difficult for an editor or a proofreader uh, or a monitor uh, to, to look at. Uh, it, it seemed to me in the early days of Wikipedia, Jimmy Wales said, yeah, there's a little of this, it's not true, but we depend on the crowd to come in and clean it up for us. And then they separated that out and some people are protected, public figures, everything else, you know, you're, you're on your own. How do we deal with social media that may have good intention, but now have admitted they don't have the capability to monitor this. So again, I think when you talk about uh, um, Section 230 in particular, you know what what often happens is is people think what you're suggesting is you either have complete immunity from liability for anything that happens uh, on social media platforms, or you have strict liability, which is a straw man that is immediately can be immediately knocked down in the way that you've just described, right? You cannot say, well, now you're responsible for everything that that is that goes on 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 your platform. Um, what we really need to do is to figure out what is what we do in every other context. What is a reasonable standard of care, right? Mm -hmm. So, we're, so we're, I think we're past the point where we say, look, you have no responsibility. You don't have to do anything, or if you want to do something voluntarily, you know that that's great. Um, to we as a society need to decide what it is we want these platforms to do. How much content moderation, you know, do what 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 power for 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 censorship potentially do we want to put into their hands? Uh, but but what obligation do we want to impose on them? Um, and we need to have that conversation. And I think we need to develop a reasonable standard of care. What is reasonable to ask these platforms to do, and then we can hold them to that reasonable standard. So I, it seems to me that that's something that <clears throat> we ought to be thinking about. And then there are the, go ahead, go ahead. Well, no, I was just gonna say, there seem to be two approaches. One, I, I sat through the hearings that Mark Zuckerberg um, was invited to in the House of Commons in the spring of 18. I was living and teaching in London. Um, and what, a BBC reporter said, well, there you have it. A, um, a young MP from Sussex has just compared Mr. Zuckerberg to a Disney animatronic. Uh, you know, the BBC is pretty direct about this. Mm -hmm. But what I think worried Mr. Zuckerberg at that time is that there are two divergent approaches. In the US, it seems to me that Congress is thinking about breaking up Facebook and some of these other companies into constituent pieces, Instagram, WhatsApp, and so on. But in the UK, and unsurprisingly, the EU, they're thinking about regulating them as a public utility. So they wouldn't report to a board of directors. They would report to a utilities regulatory commission uh, elected by the ratepayers. Um, any preference on either of those? So, uh, you know, people who are uh, much smarter about these issues than I am, who are, you know, having these conversations, uh, I, you know, the folks that I find most compelling uh, suggest that we really need to, to look at both, right? So we need some structural reform, but that in and of itself is not going to be enough if you don't have a regulator who can uh, make sure, uh, you know, that again, as you say, things change so rapidly. The ability for Congress to write a law or for a court, even at a single point in time, to issue a decision the way we had in AT&T about the structural reform of our tech companies is really not realistic, right? So that can be a start, 
but then you need to be, uh, they, there needs to be some regulation in place because that is a little bit more agile than either of those other two uh, uh -huh. mechanisms. Uh, and also is a way to make sure that, that, that this is having the effect that we uh, hope for it to have. And so structural reforms sort of breaking apart perhaps some aspects um, is maybe part of the solution, but things like requiring interoperability. I mean, one of the things that makes this so challenging is what we call net effects, right? So the tech companies um, are, are, are able to provide tremendous benefits to all of us, but also obviously to themselves in terms of the amount of data that they can collect and use um, because they are so huge. And, uh, and, and it is- quarterly net profits are right. eye-watering. Yeah, uh, and, it, and it is inherently, um, I think, uh, stifling some competition. Think about this in terms of social media mm -hmm. platforms. If, if you're on Facebook uh, and you don't like some of the toxic things that go on, or you don't like their privacy policy, you don't like their algorithms that pull people down into this disinformation vortex, yeah. um, you don't have a whole lot of options. And if somebody wants to create a social media platform that, that doesn't have those problems, that has found a way to address those issues, and you want to move over there, Unless all of your friends and family move over with you, yeah. you know you're not gonna you're not gonna go there because you well, can't communicate with them, right? In, in a business so, school, so, so we talk about those as barriers to exit. What are the barriers to exit? Barriers to entry. Well, you don't get your you don't get your pictures back. They now own the copyright to those. You don't get your friends back. You don't get anything back. Now I will I will tell you quite honestly. I left Facebook late in 2019. I wrote Mr. Zuckerberg a letter, which I'm sure he didn't read, telling him I thought he was a threat to democracy and the world as we know it. I did not hear back. Um, but let me tell you what I did get back. I got back an hour of my life. Every day I spent an hour on Facebook scrolling through these entries. And by the end of the hour, I was angry, I was depressed, I was upset, and it was an hour later. And so I discovered initially I was getting anxious. So where's my Facebook? After about two weeks, I didn't miss any of it. And that may be a function of my age, but I would tell you, I got an hour a day of my life back when I left the platform. I don't feel that way about LinkedIn or about you know other platforms. Um, though I will tell you, LinkedIn is now considering anonymous posting and my advice to them when they asked me was simple. I said, don't do this. So Twitter banned Mr. Trump. And if, we, if I take you over to Twitter and introduce you to Jack Dorsey or Brandon Borman, um, they seem to me to be good people and they seem to me to be well-intentioned. A couple of years ago, Jack gathered the group in a conference room and said, okay, donuts and coffee. And if it extends late, we'll go with pizza and you know soft drinks. When we get out of here, we will, uh, our, our goal is to remove dehumanizing speech from the Twitter platform. After three days, they gave up and concluded two things. One, that they could not define dehumanizing speech in a way that the platform could fairly remove, identify and remove it. And the other thing they concluded is that the former president of the United States couldn't have an account. So, you know, as you know, on the 7th of January, they removed the former president's Twitter account. And I, I would like your reaction to that. Has, has that action struck you as a move in the right direction or as, uh, capricious. What do you think the outcome of that has been? So, uh, you know, I think it's important to, uh, to not allow uh, disinformation that particularly around something as fundamentally important as legitimacy of our election. Um, so to not allow lies about that to just continue to propagate. And, uh, and, and so uh, a policy and these platforms can have their terms of use and their, their policies, their private companies. But a policy that says, if you are a repeat offender, 
pushing out, you know, clear lies uh, about something as fundamental uh, as the legitimacy of our election, um, that we're going to take you down and uh, take down the account. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, could they do that? Uh, you know, would it be appropriate to do that in the middle of the president's term as opposed to in the final days of his term, you know, we can have that conversation. But, yeah. um, but what I think, listen, I, I, I think at the end of the day, those things are band-aids uh, on what I see as the threat, right? So, so what we've been talking about are, you know, some of the techniques that we might use to go after the techniques that are used to spread disinformation. And the reason that I push so hard on reinvigorating civics education as the sustainable long-term comprehensive way to deal with this is because it gets to the content and it is threat agnostic. Regardless of who is spreading these pernicious narratives right. to try to weaken our democracy and undermine public engagement and the, uh, you know, um, people's confidence in their ability to be informed. Uh, we need to empower Americans to resist those narratives, right? Um, to, to understand our democracy, how it's supposed to function, what is there to hold institutions accountable, and what is the role of individuals in right. holding those institutions accountable, and how can we and must we be agents of change? And that way, I think, you know, if we can really teach critical thinking, right? Um, and uh, about how to be responsible members of our society. If we can reinvigorate a sense of civic identity, my, one of the things that I'm pushing for right now <clears throat> is a year of civic renewal. I think as we come out of the isolation of COVID, hopefully over the next several months, um, and in the wake of this horribly divisive uh, election and its aftermath, um, that we need to mobilize as a nation around rediscovering our sense of community, our sense of civic identity, right? To come out into the streets to work together towards a common purpose on, on civic engagement in our communities, uh, where we work side by side with people with whom we disagree so that it's so much harder to demonize someone that you interact with in the real world versus where we've all been forced to interact, which is online for the last year. So I think we have a challenge, but also a wonderful opportunity here to re-engage um, and, and rediscover a sense of American identity and civic identity. Well, I yeah, I completely agree with that. So let me let me bring us then from the social media platforms into our own communities. Um, first, for the adults in the community, uh, or perhaps even for you know the more sophisticated high school students, um, are there any online platforms? I mean, other than Snopes or a couple of others, that you would recommend as go-to sorts of um, touchstones to determine whether something is true, to double check. For me, and I'm, I'm old school, you know, I, as a grad student in Philadelphia, I used to go down to the corner and buy the New York Times for 15 cents. Um, it's, it's no longer 15 cents and it's no longer in black and white, but I use the Times and then now with the internet, of course, I get the Wall Street Journal and the, the, the FT, but I also read the English language edition of the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung and the Asahai Shimban in Tokyo, a few others, just to check and see what they say about all of this. Is, are there sources you go to? Are there sources you would recommend? So I'm I'm old, even older than you, and so That's like hard you, to believe. I like believe. you, I you know I rely on uh, you know fairly traditional media sources, but you but you make the important point, which is you need to go to multiple sources. There's no one place that you can go to and say, oh well, this one place is is you know is all I need to know and all I need to look at. 
Um, the key really when we teach about critical thinking and media literacy is to look at multiple sources, right? And to, and to try to look at sources that you believe come at an issue from different perspectives, have different insights uh, into an issue, into an event, into what may have happened. Um, I would bet that your students who are watching today and absolutely high school students um, could put in the chat space uh, the, the kinds of sources that they rely upon, uh, they who are much more tech savvy than either you or I. Well, um, the interesting thing about that, I think, is that I've discovered, and there's evidence to prove this, that the younger you are, the less tolerant you are of long form text. And when my uh, millennial and Gen Y um, and increasingly Gen Z students say, this is a pretty long article, professor, or this is a long chapter, I would say, well, you're lucky you're not a law student uh, or a med student. They're reading 300 pages a night. So, you know, <laughs> be grateful this is a business school. Um, reading is clearly a key, but if you get most of your news on your phone, you're not getting long form text. So then you, your notion is that multiple sourcing to sort of back that up. I will tell you each day, if anybody cares, the Times of London is available very inexpensively and has what I think is a wonderful balance. Even though owned by Rupert Murdoch, it's quite a good newspaper. Um, I do read several other uh, North American papers, just you know, a strategy to read the paper. You read all the headlines, you read uh, for many of the stories, at least first couple paragraphs. So you're alerted to what's news, but you're also alerted to whether or not something is different from what you read elsewhere. What, what I would say, excuse me, I would say that the other place that I go to on a daily basis, I do, uh, I really do like Twitter. Uh, I follow people who I know to be authoritative sources, uh, who I know to be critical thinkers, who I know to, you know, challenge and, and, and also be able to explain things that are in the press. And I learn a great deal um, from, from following them on Twitter. And to your point about, you know, reading and long form and sort of scrolling through your Facebook posts and rapid, uh, one of the things that I have found uh, most important is to never assume that a headline is really telling you the story. That is the most damaging thing that you can do is, and I have been uh, tempted on more than one occasion I read a headline, I read the first paragraph and I think, oh my gosh, and, I, and I'm about to retweet it. And then I think, you know, I should read the whole article. Yeah. And you'll often read through and realize that the headline was completely misleading. Well, and the article an doesn't say anything for, like that. Yes, yeah. an editor for a newspaper that I once wrote for when I was um, a college student uh, in my hometown of Montana uh, said, <clears throat> Any newspaper headline that ends with a question mark, the answer is invariably no. <laughs> Trouble for Hillary? <laughs> question mark, right? <laughs> you know, it right. turns out if you read, eh, probably not. Right. So there, it's almost mm -hmm. like clickbait. It's designed to draw you in and engage you. Let me let me ask in the, in the couple of moments left to us here: Is there anything parents can do? Uh, to engage their children or provide advice or to provide technology or a subscription or whatever. If you're a parent, what should you do to ensure that the things your children know are actually true? So uh, listen, I think this is the same uh, advice that applies to parenting kind of across the board. And it starts with modeling good behavior, mm. right? So so be informed yourself, right? Um, subscribe to a print publication. It could be a weekly magazine or a daily paper, your local newspaper. Um, you know, demonstrate <clears throat> your own interest. In, you know, maybe watch evening news together, uh, but demonstrate that kind of behavior. And then I think to, uh, 
pursuant to our earlier conversation about toxic uh, discourse, um, model civil discourse, right? One of the things that our population as a whole needs to really learn, relearn is how to have civil conversations where we disagree and not immediately demonize uh, those with whom we disagree. And so parents need to look for opportunities to model that kind of civil discourse because Lord knows young people are seeing uh, bad behavior coming out of Washington, coming out of politicians across the country, uh, and certainly in their online forums uh, about how not to have these conversations. So um, it's a challenge for parents, uh, but I think just modeling good behavior is a really good start. Yeah. Suzanne Spaulding, thank you so much for your time, your expertise, and your willingness to share those with us. We deeply appreciate it. Uh, thank you again. We, we, um, we're better for your having been here. Oh, so, thank you. Thanks for having me. This is session number three. Session four takes place a week from today on Friday, March 19th, when uh, Matthew Turek of DARPA will join us, the Defense uh, Advanced Research Projects Agency. His research includes computer vision, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and their application to problems of significant societal impact. So 1040 next Friday morning, I'll see you right here. Thanks, everyone. Care for yourselves.